Hey folks, so this week I actually planned on putting out another goofy media analysis video. Then I had an argument on Twitter, wasted about 5 hours on that. Uh, then I spent another 10 hours straight writing this. So, uh, enjoy. Also, because it'd be really awkward to slot in anywhere else, this is where I'm going to put my plug for today's sponsor, Skillshare, a massively popular online learning tool offering classes in subjects ranging from art, editing, design, and more. I actually looked into Eve Williams' class on research and referencing this month as a quick academic refresher, and it wound up helping me quite a lot with this video. I've also checked out Nikki Henderson's class on project management in real life. For whatever it is you're looking for, you can give Skillshare share a shot today with an annual subscription of just 10 bucks a month. On top of that, if you use the link down in the description, you and the other first thousand people to sign up will get two free months to try out the service. So give it a shot and explore your creativity today with Skillshare. With that, let the inane ranting begin. So I think the online left has a problem. That problem is Hello, this. Hello everyone. So today I want to talk about white identity. Contemporary fascists share three core beliefs. One, people of European heritage are or ought to constitute a biological, cultural, and political unity known as the white race, sometimes dog-whistled as Western culture. Thomas claims that this is all part of a deliberate conspiracy to trick white people out of their history. The women were not wearing their hair in French braids. They're fucking communists, Jacques! Okay, don't worry, I'm not being spicy today. Nobody's getting cancelled. What I've just shown are a smattering of extremely popular online figures often cited by budding lefties as major influences for their own political transitions. All of these figures have done good, valuable work often focusing on debunking far-right conspiracies and frequent talking oh, yeah. points. So, let's give this bloke another shot and see where his arguments have led him. Even on my own end, while I wouldn't say these channels brought me to the left, they definitely gave me a lot of arguments I didn't have before, and I have great appreciation for that and the work they continue to do in that realm and beyond. The thing is, there are a few issues that often arise when the roots of your politics are so focused on taking on far-right talking points, and today I'm going to focus on one of them. The conversation around cultural genocide. Whether you'd count yourself among the people influenced by the creators I've just shown, or even if you have no clue what I'm talking about, there's a good chance when you hear someone talk about the need to preserve a culture to prevent cultural genocide, you're going to imagine someone like this. Nowadays, especially in the US, the conversation around the idea of cultural genocide often stems from conservative talking points about the erasure of Western values and, in extreme cases, the death of white culture in the face of increased multiculturalism and the promotion of liberal and left-wing ideology. So Europe has had a culture, a distinctive culture, a series of them, for like thousands of years. All of a sudden, a ton of people move in who disagree with the tenets of that culture, and they're changing it. And I think something that's quite easy to do in response to these kinds of assertions is to juxtapose it with the very direct acts of genocide committed against marginalized groups at pretty much the exact same time these vague complaints about cultural oppression of white people are being laid out. It's very hard to care about the kind of genocide these groups are talking about when it's in contrast to the actual mass slaughter of racial and religious minorities across the world, both in the recent past and the present day. Here's the catch. When we argue like this, there is also an implicit statement being made that direct, violent genocide is the real thing we should actually care about, and cultural genocide is just kind of the flimsy dog whistle version of the concept pushed by people who want to feel like they're the new oppressed group while still remaining the dominant majority. So today I want to do two things. 
First, I want to make the case that cultural genocide is a real, legitimate thing, even divorced from its more direct, violent forms. And on top of that, I want to make the case that when divorced from that, this is still something we should care about, rather than just discarding as overblown whining about a naturally evolving culture. And to make things as straightforward as possible, we're gonna take this in three stages. From the most to least obvious forms so-called cultural genocide takes in society. And yes, don't worry fans of the channel, I'll probably mention something about movies somewhere in here too. But bear in mind, this is probably gonna be a more bleak and serious video, given the subject being covered. Okay. If you've looked into this topic to any degree, what probably popped into your head when I suggested the idea of a cultural genocide outside of literally genociding a population was this. Re-education camps, particularly directed towards colonized indigenous groups in so-called developing nations. And yes, this would be an obvious example of that. Though this has happened to varying degrees across Europe, Asia, Africa... Okay, though this has happened to varying degrees basically everywhere in the world, US viewers would probably be most familiar with the history of so-called American Indian boarding schools. These are schools which were set up in the US in the mid-19th century, with the apparent goal of helping indigenous youth assimilate into Euro-American culture, educating them in the English language, Judeo-Christian values, as well as teaching them necessary skills to integrate them into the hegemonic order. Real quick, I'm going to be using this term a lot, so in case you don't know, hegemony basically just means the dominant social group. Academics use it because if you say majority, that can create confusion when the people in charge aren't actually the majority of the population, and also they get a sexual thrill out of knowing words other people don't. Anyway, as should be obvious enough, the intentions of these schools were in no way, shape, or form a humanitarian practice. It was, to put it lightly, basically good marketing for an institution to kidnap tens of thousands of children and put them into camps with horrible living conditions so that they could be indoctrinated through constant physical and psychological abuse to serve as cheap, compliant labour. It also had the net benefit of alienating those children from the families and tribes they'd come from, which aided in suppressing possible organisation and rebellion against the state. Just a totally unexpected side benefit there. That is, if these kids were even given the chance to reintegrate with their families, stories of indigenous people in the US and Canada completely losing touch with their own heritage are so common that it would take far too much time to go over even just the personal stories I was sent when I first started researching for this video. Now, to be clear, not all of the people engaging in this practice had malicious intentions. Some genuinely believed that in, air quotes, civilizing the native people this way, they were doing something charitable and altruistic, which only really makes the real-world outcomes of their actions all the more Almost sinister. Being saved and I should be grateful for the life that I've been given because any child on the reservation would give anything to live as I was living. They took us away from our mom. So, as I said, this would doubtless qualify as the more obvious example of cultural genocide you could think of marginalized communities being forcefully torn apart by the state so that they can have their native cultures eradicated, primarily for the purposes of enforcing a subjugated underclass and oppressing possible revolts. This was a remarkably common practice throughout the world historically, and as I've mentioned, remains the case to this day in certain regions. If you're from the UK, there's a fair chance you'd note the many similar practices once inflicted in Irish and Welsh communities by the oppressive British state, with Gaelic languages almost going extinct just a few decades ago. And it makes total sense why these things would be done. It's an extremely effective way to simultaneously eliminate opposition to hegemony 
while escaping the costly conflict and bad PR of outright murdering these groups. To this day, whether this even qualifies as a form of genocide remains in contention. It's essentially the genocide equivalent of the game where you put your finger really close to someone and say you aren't touching them. Meeting all the criteria of forceful state-induced eradication of a community through violent means, but uh uh uh, we're not just straight up slaughtering them en masse. So does it really count as an act of genocide? The thing about this form of cultural genocide is that the harm it does is probably obvious even to the sorts of people who don't consider the eradication of cultures to be necessarily harmful outside of direct violence. Because this one does involve direct violence. With the people indoctrinated through these practices being robbed of their families, oftentimes physically abused, frequently sexually abused, universally psychologically abused, and ultimately turned into discount labour. So now the new question. How about cultural genocide that doesn't involve the oppressed physically having their communities torn apart and destroyed? Please brace yourselves if you're familiar with the things I'm about to talk about, because I'm about to absolutely butcher some pronunciations. So in writing this video, I got in touch with a viewer born and raised in Réunion Island, a region in the Indian Ocean currently within the French Republic. They described to me how within their community, there are two distinct tongues. The official language, French, and Réunionese Creole, a sort of patchwork tongue mostly comprised of simplified French, but also including terms from Portuguese, Hindi, Malagasy, and more, born out of necessity in the past. Terre-là, la Réunion, tout le monde y cause français, créole réunionnais. Le créole réunionnais, c'est un mélange entre euh, le français simplifié que Bonne Colomb l'a appris de ses ancêtres, avec des tailles en spécificité qui vient de pas par le langage que Bana y connaît déjà. Si l'île toute d'Homo ni pre ou presque cause créole, et pourtant, la langue n'a très peu de représentation dans nos institutions officielles. À l'école ou quand nous les face à l'administration, nous les pas censés cause créole. So, let me scratch my linguistics undergrad itch right now and drop some red hot terms on you. What I'm describing is an example of a pidgin language developing into a creole, with the pidgin language being the loose, unofficial tongue created when communities with multiple different languages are put together and need to communicate, and the creole being the more stable form of that language that ultimately develops. You could argue most languages are in some ways born from creoles, Though what does or doesn't get to be called a creole versus a normal language winds up lending itself to the same implicit biases and assumptions you get when someone tries to distinguish a normal religion from a cult. Have you subscribed to r slash atheism? This situation, what we'd call diglossia, where there is one designated lower class language or dialect and a state approved official language, is actually extremely common. It's been seen in regions of China, Jamaica, Singapore, Gibraltar, Ukraine. Many have even argued the USA would qualify, with the split between English and AAVE based on similar oppressive historical roots. And it's the case here, with the Réunionese people. Réunionese Creole is actually not even the minority language spoken, it's the native tongue of 90% of the population. Yet, as I've said, French has been designated the official language. It's the language of administration, governance. It's the main language taught in schools, with the only other compulsory language being English, which incidentally is only fluently spoken by a small minority of the Réunionese people. The crucial distinction here is that unlike what I discussed in my first segment, in the modern day, it's not like there's a system of direct state-enforced brutality on people simply for speaking their native tongue, though that is not to say by any means that violence hasn't occurred as a result. Yet, these decisions by the state have still resulted in a form of deep cultural oppression. Due to this institutional bias towards French, Illiteracy is markedly higher among the Creole-speaking population. This, combined with this bias, 
has also led to more general forms of disenfranchisement, struggles with employment, and generations of poverty. The Creole-speaking population is far less likely to take meaningful roles in Reunionese government, and these are only the most obvious material outcomes of these policies. Social stigmas have also formed. The viewer I spoke to remarked of an occasion wherein the local mayor had put up a sign with the creolized version of the city's name, which led to outcry with many indicating this was somehow shameful or disrespectful to the city. From the broad material pressures to the subtler social stigmas, these are the mechanics that lead to what can fairly be called a cultural genocide. While we now approach something closer to individual choice than with my first example, you can still see how there is a kind of implicit force in what cultures are encouraged and which are stigmatized. And once again, it's hard not to notice a link between these decisions and the marginalized lower classes having a cultural heritage, one that could otherwise offer a kind of unifying power, be torn apart. Without the need for any literal violent genocide, a community and a people still wind up broken and subjugated. Another viewer I'd spoken to, this time from St. Lucia, remarked on a similar feeling of cultural alienation, being raised in a family that was seen as something of a success story within their community. Their father had a relatively successful career, and in large part this was a result of treating his lower class cultural roots with general disdain. To this day, this viewer does not know their native Creole equivalent of Patois, being discouraged from this and other signifiers of their heritage by their father. And when they've brought up their excitement for local traditions such as the annual Jeune Creole, their father would dismiss this remarking that its traditional Creole cuisine was nothing more than hard times food. For our last segment, let's consider a question. Can a culture be eradicated not by direct state violence, not even by institutional pressure, and still be considered an act of harmful cultural genocide? And for this, I'm going to say the answer is yes, and we're going to point the finger at our old nemesis... Imagine you are from a small indigenous community in a so-called developing nation. Within your community, you have your own language, your own cultural customs, histories, and forms of art. Now imagine opportunities from first world industries present themselves to you. Maybe that industry comes to you, or you have the chance to go to them. Here's the catch. You can only take part in this industry if you speak English. Luckily, these industries have set up schools, often even free schools, that will not only educate you on the English language, but also on the cultural customs of this nation, so that you can more easily integrate and find work. All of this is entirely your choice. Naturally, you pick up what you can, and then when your kids reach schooling age, you immediately send them to these schools so that they will have greater opportunities as they grow older. As a result of this trend, a social stigma begins to form around your native customs and the use of your native tongue, with the perception that these things are associated with the lower classes and therefore those of lower social standing. Even without the state enforcement we described earlier, the community is still incentivized to drop the language and affectations of the past, and assimilate into the dominant force of this first world industry. And by the time they have kids, they're not even being taught these old customs. Your children have no interest in your old heritage, and your grandchildren can barely interact with you. Your language dies with you, and with it your traditions, your art, your histories, and anything else associated with it. Now, the question is, is this an example of a culture's natural death, or a culture being forcibly killed with the use of economic power? I think it's easy to hold a stance on the issue of cultural genocide that some variation on, I'm not against the death of a culture, I'm just against that culture being forcibly killed. 
And certainly, a lot of what we've gone over so far would still probably come under that distinction. I doubt most people with this opinion would be okay with what's happened to the Native Americans just because there wasn't a big sign saying kill all Native Americans hung over the schools. But I think if there's anything I really want people watching this to consider, it's that the line you're probably thinking of is a lot more blurry than you might think it is. And nowhere is that more exemplified than under capitalism. In the modern world, even more so than state authorities, Capital controls everything. There is no single flaw more obvious to the core tenets of liberalism than the freedom of power offered to those with material wealth. If you've got enough money, you might as well be the president or the king. And in many ways, this does extend to culture. This might sound like a bit of a big hot take, but I would argue that saying we should just leave culture to natural change in our current system is basically like saying we should just leave trade to the free market. Certainly the idea that we should just leave things to turn out how they turn out with no regulation or interference sounds like the most freedom and liberty way to do things. But we've all seen how that plays out in material terms. Free markets lead to private institutions doing whatever they can to tilt the board in their favour. Then we get monopolies. We get wealth being pulled up in smaller and smaller contingents of the population. Vaster and vaster divisions in wealth equality. The rich get richer, the poor get poorer, the opportunities to change this dwindles, and suddenly we're in something that doesn't seem very much like a free state at all. Increasingly, large portions of the population are realising this is the case. But I think there's something to be said about applying the same logic when it comes to the disenfranchisement and alienation felt by a great number of marginalised communities in the present day. You might think that the scenario I described earlier is a niche edge case. Well, what if I told you that this not only isn't an edge case, but is the dynamic that occurs the overwhelming majority of the time cultural genocide takes place? Roughly once every two weeks, another native language dies. The suppression and ultimate eradication of cultures, both through implicit and explicit means, is occurring on a constant basis. These are heritages that aid in unifying a society's most vulnerable groups, something seen the world over in black and indigenous liberation movements. And yet, not only are these practices rarely called out for the hegemonic abuses they are, but often they're characterised in the public consciousness as some skewed version of humanitarianism. I've actually barely gotten into the role propaganda plays in this, manufacturing consent for the exact cultural eradication I've talked about in this video. In any case, now you might see what I mean when I say this topic is a lot more complicated than it may first appear. Because the idea that culture death is a natural process and is only negative when explicitly forced on a population is one that ultimately leads to an economic hegemony essentially getting to control which cultures get to live and which are forced to die. Now, there's a fairly simple reason why when neo-Nazis and white supremacists talk about cultural genocide, it's a very different conversation. Because they aren't actually experiencing a cultural genocide. Particularly in the West, white Europeans and Christians and whatever else are not currently at threat of being consumed by hegemony. They are hegemony, and the only reason they're using the same terminology an actually oppressed group might is because they implicitly know this is a subject worth taking seriously. You'll see the same thing when these same groups characterise criticism of media products as a form of censorship, except I'm much less likely to see anyone on the left pretend censorship can't be a real problem, as I am to see people on the left pretend talk of preserving cultures is nothing but a Nazi dog whistle. As I said at the start, 
I think the online left has a problem. Well, it has a few different problems, as any growing movement would. But I think a big one is a lack of understanding of the power that culture has in empowering and disempowering groups. In our efforts to distinguish ourselves from liberals, who try to speak about culture at the exclusion of any other material concern, and conservatives who constantly try to assert a cultural narrative that's basically the opposite of anything resembling the real world. If you were to assemble a list, a hierarchy of concerns or problems this country faces, where would white supremacy be on the list? It's actually not a real problem in America. We can often wind up dismissing these ideas entirely as petty distractions from real economic injustice. My point would be this. If we want to build the kind of broad, unified movements against that injustice, we need to start taking these concerns from marginalized groups deadly seriously. By letting the conversation around cultural genocide be handed over to the right, we are in a very real way whitewashing a problem that has led to the torment and suffering of hundreds of thousands of minority groups for centuries. And in doing so, alienating those groups from the exact political movements that seem to be the most natural allies to their plight. And to be clear, this isn't me saying that I believe all cultural customs, by nature of tradition, are equally inherently valuable. I am by no means a traditionalist, and it would not be hard for me to give examples of traditions I see as equally harmful and oppressive. Don't do genital mutilation, folks. But again, this does not mean abandoning this issue entirely. The power of hegemony, be it through state violence or economic pressure, is the foundation of the unjust hierarchies we're all opposed to. And in these issues, we see hegemony not just bring about the eradication of these marginalized cultures, but often the eradication of their arts and histories, and so much else that can enrich a society and bind a community. So it's not enough to simply say, I don't care about race or faith or culture, I just want class equality. If you care about political outreach, about solidarity and building a unified movement, take these matters of cultural genocide seriously. Especially when it comes to marginalized communities, the preservation of cultures is a left-wing concern. Yes, all of these talking points can be mangled into dog whistles. That's kind of the Nazi's whole M.O. But it's up to you to have the nuance in your beliefs to try and discern when that is and isn't the case. Hey folks, thanks for watching. As I said at the start, this is a topic I'm pretty passionate about, and I appreciated the chance to talk about it here. So, for obvious reasons, there's a good chance this video will probably get demonetized, so if you like it, please consider throwing me a buck or two over on Patreon if you enjoy. You can also use coffee for one-time donations. If you like these non-media focused videos and want to see more of them, please share this video around so I know I can produce more like it and still, you know, earn a living. Backing on Patreon will get you in the credits scrolling by now. I'd like to take the opportunity to shout out Cav P, who very generously offered to help edit the script for this video while I was writing it. You can check out their own work with the links in the description. On top of this, I'd like to give a special thanks to patrons A Recusant, Angara Thomas, Atticus Cassidy, Benjamin David Zala Brown, Callenstein, Connor D, Dapney, George Soros, Hannah the Ace, India, Jason H. Peters, JCCM, John Carmack, Leon Weigel, Liam the Music Reviewer, Lolzy Gag, Malpatuis, Snowy, and Torin the Exile, with an extra special thanks to Charlotte Allen, Jamie Bellamy Mayer, and Leftist Tech Support. Finally, I'd like to thank Skillshare for once again sponsoring this video. Check out the links down in the description for a special offer on their service. Other than that, I look forward to your comments. Have a great week, and stay safe.